Uh, welcome. Thanks for taking 90 minutes out of this spring-like day to come and, uh, and join us for our ongoing program on afterlives at the uh, Wolf Humanities Center. I'm Jim English, a professor of English. Um, that's called an aptonym. I, I was <laughs> told they call it an aptonym. Um, and I am the director of the Wolf Humanities uh, Center. So thanks for coming. I'm really looking forward to, uh, to Ben Wargaff's uh, talk today about uh, lab meat. Um, if you heard that we were doing a, um, a reception afterwards, a wine and lab meat reception, that's not true. That's a, that is a, fa that's a false rumor. The museum wouldn't allow it. Uh, um, so we'll get to that. I'm excited, but I wanted to call your attention to a few other events um, that are coming up. Next week is spring break. Come back after spring break. In fact, on the Sunday, the 11th, at the end of that week, we, um, we continue our Afterlives film series here in the museum in this theater. That's Sunday the 11th, 2 p.m. here. It's a film called, um, have, you, have You Seen the Arana? It's a South Asian film. It's about a, um, an Indian farmer who is um, growing, uh, preserving rare uh, varieties of rice for future generations. I think it'll be interesting. There'll be two professors um, with expertise uh, in, uh, in, in that area who are going to be talking about the film and answering questions. So that's, uh, that's Sunday the 11th. Then on Friday, March 16th, we have two events. We have an all-day conference. That's our undergraduate humanities uh, fellows conference. The undergraduate fellows present the research projects they've been working on on Afterlives. They're calling their conference Pushing Daisies. And uh, it's always fun. They're great. It's amazing the quality of their work and of their presentations. Um, you could stop in for just a few minutes of that or stay all day. It's in Kislak, the sixth floor in the library, a lovely space uh, as well. That same evening, uh, Friday the 16th at 5.30 p.m., uh, Edwidge Danticat, the, uh, the, the renowned uh, Haitian-American novelist and essayist, she's going to be speaking about death and writing and race and freedom um, at Perry World House. That event is going to be very crowded. It's going to be very full. If you, th if you think you'd like to go, you should register in advance, I think, for that event. Also, note the time. It's 5.30, not 6, as printed in our brochure. In fact, if you're using the brochure um, to, uh, to guide you through our program, uh, throw it away because we go to print. It's a beautiful brochure. Sarah Varney, our brilliant uh, designer and, and, and uh, associate director, made the, uh, the brochure. But we, we go to print with that in what, late July? So of 2017, here we are heading into March 2018. It is obsolete. Um, we've added a lot of things. We've changed some things. Um, in the two and a half weeks after spring break, we've got 10 events. And most of them are not in that brochure. Okay, so look to the website. Um, Sarah also sends out beautiful e-blasts every week that tell you what's going on. If you're not getting those and you'd like to, just let us know. We'll put you on the list. Okay, um, the topic director for our Afterlives program is Emily Wilson. As a professor of classics, she's devoted her life, at least her professional life, to uh, ensuring that the, uh, the texts of the, the, great, the great texts of ancient times enjoy the afterlives they deserve in the 21st century. She's written books on Socrates, on Seneca, on the, uh, the, 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 the idea of overliving, of living past your prime. And most recently, she's published a fresh, rigorous, no bullshit translation of the Odyssey that has been called a cultural landmark. Um, and uh, she uh, looks to be the, the translator of record for the Odyssey for the foreseeable future into, into the English language. Um, so it's been exciting to see that take off, and it's been really fun working with Emily at the Wolf Center. She's going to introduce our speaker. Let's give a hand to Emily Wilson. Thank you so much, Jim, and thank you all for being here. I'm delighted to introduce Ben Wagoft, who is a visiting scholar in anthropology at MIT. He's an intellectual historian trained in the history of philosophy and social thought um, in modern times from 1800 to the present. His book, Thinking in Public, Strauss, Levinas, Arendt, was published in um, 2016. 
So that's one side of him, but he's also a food journalist, food ethnographer, and food theorist. And his talk today will combine these usually totally separate disciplines, intellectual history, political thought, and the study of foodways. The talk will engage with our year-long theme of afterlives, in that it's about what might happen after the lives of individual animals are taken and processed for meat, and also in a future which Wogroff describes as either dystopian, utopian, or weird, in which we might be all eating lab-grown meat, the, the time after our quote-unquote normal ways of eating meat. Speaking personally, I'm totally excited about the talk, both as an anti-meat eater and as someone who works on the Odyssey, as Jim said. It's a poem which, which provides um, a lot of thought about the good and bad ways to eat, and specifically to eat meat, from the roasted sacrificial meat that proves men are men and heroes are heroes, to the cattle of the sun, obviously not a good meat to eat, and the cannibalism of the Cyclops, the Lystragonians. Wogwaft is an extraordinarily broad, wide-ranging scholar who's interested in the scientific, historical, philosophical, ethical, and environmental implications of this huge topic. So we can look forward to a truly interdisciplinary discussion which can showcase some of the many different directions that, human that humanities can go. Please join me in welcoming him to Penn. Uh, oh my goodness. Um, thank you so much for that very generous introduction, Emily and Jim. And I want to offer um, in gratitude sacrificial hecatombs to Jim, Emily, to the staff of the Wolf Humanities Center. That's uh, Sarah Varney, Sarah Molinsky, uh, Margie Guy, and Sierra Lamuto. Um, and thank you all for being here this afternoon. This happens also to be uh, the beginning of Purim. So you may imagine this to be a kind of non-traditional uh, Purim spiel. <laughs> I tend to move around a little bit. Um, this will confine me a little bit. Um, if I wander off mic and you can't hear me, please uh, wave your arms about madly from the back of the room, okay? Good, good, good. It is 4.30 a.m. in Los Angeles on August 5th, 2013, and I'm waking up to a weird future. I'm about to watch the meat of tomorrow appear at noon in London. My bleary eyes and smudged computer screen, a double set of windows in time and space. The future will arrive in the form of laboratory-grown meat made of bovine muscle cells that proliferated in a bioreactor. Meat, apparently, will never be the same, and neither will we. A basic fact about our species is that for longer than we've been homo sapiens sapiens, we have eaten from the bodies of dead animals. Um, that may soon change. Technological progress could move us along a track that leads from hunting to farming to the laboratory. The animal body might disappear completely from our food system. You might need to drive for hours into the country to see one of the herds of cows that range free, preserved for the sake of genetic diversity. Um, such transitions are very serious business, but if we're really perched on one of history's great pivot points, it's good to keep our sense of humor. There's something inherently silly about the idea of an international media event staged around a hamburger, one of the world's most recognizable and mundane foods. At the world's fairs and expositions of a previous era, novel foods were displayed to crowds of visitors inside glass pavilions. The critic, Walter Benjamin, called these fairs sites of pilgrimage to the commodity fetish. I might be watching the early 21st century version now. Here's uh, Mark Post. Eventually, the hamburger comes into view, and it was made by this gentleman, Mark Post, a cardiologist and professor of physiology at the University of Maastricht, along with his team of technicians. They made it not by killing and butchering a cow for its meat, um, but through the expensive and laborious use of a, tissue, of, a, of a laboratory technique known as tissue culture or cell culture first accomplished by the American embryologist Ross Harrison in 1907. One of the many promises attached to this new meat 
is that it could replace industrial animal agriculture, erasing its massive carbon footprint and the structural cruelty to animals that it entails. This meat's strangeness cannot be overstated. Um, meat that never had parents. Meat that never died in the sense that a whole animal dies and perhaps never properly lived. Meat that could utterly transform our relationship with natural forms. The story that Mark Post tells about his burger is less, it's less hyperbolic than most Silicon Valley pitches. The phrase, save the world, never comes up. But Mark stresses the environmental benefits of learning how to produce tons of beef or pork from a tiny biopsy of cells. Others in the cultured meat movement focus on the moral promise, and, and promise is going to be one of the keywords of tonight's talk, um, of eating meat without harming animals. They hope that an emerging industry will do what generations of animal protection activists failed to do and eliminate cruelty to animals from our food system. A chef arrives on stage and uh, cooks the burger, serving it to a panel of tasters. They note its differences from conventional meat. For example, the hamburger as yet lacks fat cells, but they pronounce it edible. They chew and they swallow. Today, about four and a half years later, I've joined you to report on the effort to grow meat in laboratories in order to replace industrial scale animal agriculture. Although my first training was as an intellectual historian, I've become a kind of anthropological field worker, moving between tissue culture labs and in conversation with futures consultants, environmentalists, and animal activists. It's not my task to advocate on behalf of cultured meat, but I consider myself to be uh, a sympathetic critic, sympathetic in particular to the idea that the environmental and moral problems of industrial animal agriculture cry out for remedy. I, I offer critique in the sense of investigating the terms of possibility of a specific idea. Now, if cultured meat actually replaced animal agriculture, this would transform Earth's animal biomass, the bulk of which consists of domesticated animals living and dying in our food system. The geographer Vaclav Smil has estimated that as of 1900, some 1.3 billion domesticated large animals existed on the Earth. Then as of 2000, the live weight of domesticated animals had increased by some 3.5 times. Memorably, Smil imagines, quote, sapient extraterrestrial visitors concluding on the basis of the sheer abundance of one species in particular, that, that life on the third solar planet is dominated by cattle. Were cultured meat to suddenly uh, replace its conventional antecedent, millions of gregarious vertebrates would become unnecessary, their fates uncertain. The suffering caused by industrial animal agriculture would end, but it would be replaced not so much by sudden relief as by a question mark. Some 75% of our agricultural land on Earth is used either directly or indirectly for animal agriculture that produces our meat, milk, and eggs. The land, too, would become a kind of a question mark, its fate uncertain. The, the, the critic John Berger once called the zoo an epitaph to a lost relationship between humans and other animals. Um, if industrial animal agriculture actually ended, it would remove the feedlot and the slaughterhouse and force us to imagine how else we might relate to animals that we've domesticated for their labor and the products of their bodies. Of course, we really have no idea at all if cultured meat can resolve the problems of industrial animal agriculture. Uh, as of 2013, many journalists made sport of the very high price tag of Mark Post's hamburger, which um, cost over $300,000 US to produce. I'm making sport too, I guess. Many people dismissed the idea that tissue culture could ever move from the small scale of medical research to the volume of industrial food production. 
Since 2013, a collection of academic researchers and startups have made significant progress in producing small amounts of cultured meat more cheaply, um, though the more recent figures I hear are still high enough to preclude commercialization and hover in the thousands of pounds, excuse me, uh, the thousands of dollars per pound. My question today is neither whether cultured meat will succeed nor whether or not it should. My question is what makes it imaginable and what can this imagined technology help us to understand about ourselves? Tonight's talk is a meditation in three parts. Each describes a possible future scenario in which cultured meat succeeds in emerging and becomes part of our everyday food ways. First, I'll describe the utopian vision uh, of the story of creating meat without killing animals. This, you might say that this has become the official future of the cultured meat movement. Um, an official future is a term coined by the futurist Peter Schwartz to describe a vision of the future that coordinates action in the present. This is a, a promissory future, to be sure. To paraphrase the anthropologist of science, Mike Fortune, promises about biotechnology are language running on credit, and bills eventually fall due. Second, I'm going to describe the dystopian version of this story. For many, laboratory-grown meat is dystopian in rather obvious ways that require little uh, description, either because it prompts a, a, a yuck response or because it seems to violate the order of nature. Cultured meat emerges on the scene after years of debate over GMO foods, and while it needn't be genetically modified, it nevertheless stands in the shadow of so-called frankenfoods. However, science fiction writers imagined um, laboratory-grown meat long before it began to emerge in practice, and I'll suggest that these writers have made the ersatz character of artificial meat into a quasi-ontological problem and a casual figure for a broader dystopian condition. In the process, they raise a modern problem described once by the intellectual historian Hans Blumenberg. We live in a world that is ever more made and ever uh, less grown, with consequences that are both philosophical and practical. Having described both dystopian and utopian versions of the story of cultured meat, I'm going to turn to a different vision of the future, one that is characterized simultaneously by everydayness and weirdness. By everydayness, I suppose that I mean that all new technologies become boring given time. But I want something specific from weirdness. I'll argue that the utopian official future of cultured meat represents a kind of imaginative and ethical closure in which the pursuit of a better world diminishes our options for further improving the world in a later subsequent future. In fact, a future of cultured meat would likely plunge us into a, a milieu of experiment in which we come to understand ourselves and our appetites and our ethics somewhat differently. Against the technological determinism that characterizes much futurist thinking Weirdness helps us to recapture a sense of contingency and possibility, something that the philosopher Stanley Cavell once described as finding that nature still has the capacity to surprise us. Although in this case, what surprises us is nature reworked through the interventions of scientific culture. Um, indeed, part of the technological story of cultured meat is that for animal cells, the state of nature harbors material potentials that it takes culture in the form of science to unlock. Oh. Here we are in utopia. It's an island. The official future of the cultured meat movement begins with the promise of stem cell science. Satellite muscle stem cells are taken from a harmless biopsy of muscle tissue, usually from a cow, pig, or chicken. These cells are stimulated so that they begin a cell cycle that in the animal body is part of the ordinary process of muscle repair after injury or stress. 
the stem cell proliferates both as new muscle cells and as stem cells, ensuring that the tissue, uh, muscle tissue regenerates and retains the capacity to regenerate again. Under in vitro conditions, though, a healing process becomes a production process. Stem cells have become promising objects for medical science, assumed to be the source of future therapies for all kinds of conditions, from heart disease to aging itself. But here, here they're full of potential for making meat. Um, some cultured meat scientists describe their cells in vaguely anthropomorphic terms as willing workers who only require occasional baths in a growth medium. The cells proliferate either in tea flasks under the small scale conditions of a lab or, and very hypothetically, in the large scale conditions of an industrial bioreactor. One very common idea about what cultured meat production might look like is called the, the um, carnery, which is imagined to be a little bit like a, a contemporary microbrewery <laughs> in which meat grows in tanks. And another smaller scale idea, this is, this is the one I'm really fond of, it's, it's a kebab cart. <laughs> and the uh, slides are a little, a little cut off. This is an image by the artist David Benke from 2011. And uh, I should say that creative design in the world of cultured meat vastly outstrips laboratory research. <laughs> However, it will take much larger scale and more impersonal production methods to yield enough meat to replace, say, the McDonald's hamburger. And the goal of most proponents of cultured meat is to replace such low-end or cheap meat. Um, the result, they say, will be the great diminishment and the eventual end of our immoral treatment of animals. This will also yield a world in which animal agriculture's damage to our fragile ecosystem is curtailed, um, a world in which we have a sustainable source of protein to feed a growing global population a source that avoids the risk of zoonotic diseases we now run by cramming animals into concentrated animal feeding operations. One term used by some advocates is um, clean meat, which is meant to remind us of clean energy, isn't? and which connotes moral as well as environmental cleanliness. But this raises a question borrowed from the anthropologist Mary Douglas's book, Purity and Danger. If dirt is, as Douglas characterized it, matter out of place, how can we imagine meat to be clean when it's produced outside the original animal body, or in other words, out of place? And this is, in fact, precisely the point. Uh, the term clean meat is meant to redefine meat grown in vivo in the animal as unclean, to see it as matter out of place, or in other words, to get us to write the logic of ethical vegetarianism into our very language. One prominent advocate of cultured meat recently stated that he wants to, quote, take ethics off the table for consumers by removing animal-derived meats from the supermarket. Such a bold statement might inspire reference to the Grand Inquisitor's choice in Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov. Like the Grand Inquisitor, the advocate wants a world in which our freedom to cause harm has been curtailed. In this case, not by an all-powerful authority, but by the combined forces of technological innovation and the workings of the market. We get moral redemption of a sort uh, in exchange for some of our freedom, since we've demonstrated our capacity to make the wrong choices again and again. As an aside, uh, I'll say that cultured meat has attracted a lot of animal activists who are exhausted by conventional activism and lobbying efforts on behalf of animals. Um, when these activists throw in their lot with cultured meat startups, um, it's often because they hope that new technologies combined with the workings of the market will do what activism and conventional political channels have failed to do. Now, public statements about cultured meat often include claims about the unchangeable character of human appetites. 
um, in fact, arguments for cultured meat usually draw on economists' projections uh, for a growing demand for meat over the next 30 years, particularly in India and China, where the ranks of the middle classes are expected to grow. Meat is often considered to be an income elastic commodity, meaning that we buy more of it as we can afford more. Um, the food historian Warren Belasco has argued in his book, Meals to Come, A History of the Future of Food, which is, I think, still the only history book about the history of thinking about the future of food, and an important one. Belasco has argued that a centuries-long debate between Malthusians and Cornucopians has shaped our understanding of the future of food with the Malthusians contending that we need strong measures to avoid overpopulation and, wi and widespread malnutrition and starvation, and cornucopians believing that technological progress will allow agricultural yields to continue to outrun population growth. The cultured meat movement reflects both of these intellectual tendencies. Like the Malthusians, the proponents of cultured meat believe that human appetites, both gustatory and reproductive, are not subject to restraint or change. And like Thomas Robert Malthus himself, the cultured meat movement believes that our desire for meat is unlikely to budge. And they go further than Malthus did by arguing that it may be a natural appetite. Like the cornucopians, the cultured meat movement rests on the idea that technological change displays a long-term tendency that we can call progress and that progress is sufficiently predictable to alleviate Malthusian fears. So here we are with Sir Winston. Almost all of the promotional literature and casual journalism about cultured meat finds a cornucopian precedent in a 1931 statement by Winston Churchill. In his short 50 Years Hence, which was published in The Strand, Churchill wrote, quote, we shall escape the absurdity of growing a whole chicken in order to eat the breast or wing by growing these parts separately under a suitable medium. Churchill also wrote regarding food production in general, in this part I'll just read. If gigantic sources of power become available, food would be produced without recourse to sunlight. Vast sellers in which artificial radiation is generated may replace the cornfields and potato patches of the world. Parks and gardens will cover our pastures and plowed fields. When the time comes, there will be plenty of room for the cities to spread themselves. Now, the scholar of literary utopias, Robert Eliot, described utopia as um, myth put to the test of being worked out in reality. Um, this being worked out in reality is critical. U utopia is a genre of detail. In fact, many utopian works function by describing a typical day in the life of a citizen of utopia. If cultured meat, whether in 1931 or 2018, qualifies as a utopian vision of the future, it's because thinking about cultured meat involves running the thought experiment of how our fallen world becomes another, more perfected one. Churchill suggests that if we no longer needed agricultural land, it would allow us to reroute growth and live in a world simultaneously more urbanized and more garden-like. Technology would enable us to build yet another version of that well-worn term, a second nature, and apparently without giving up on economic growth. Within a restored garden, oh, he really does have a brightly colored hamburger. Um, within a restored garden, according to the proponents of cultured meat, human appetites can remain as they were before, but they'll be rendered harmless by the technology that lines the garden's walls. That phrase, taking ethics off the table for the consumer, beautifully illustrates one dimension of cultured meat's utopian official future, something that distinguishes it from many utopias imagined by those on the political left. If the literary scholar Frederick Jameson argues 
that utopia is all we have left as a source of coherent alternatives to capitalism, cultured meat is a utopia well within capitalism's bounds. The market, after all, is its mechanism of social change. The official future of cultured meat also rests on a tacit claim about the nature of moral progress. And one of the most important actors in this story has been the philosopher Peter Singer, who has at times lent his voice in support of growing meat of, in laboratories as an alternative to animal agriculture. In 2013, Singer wrote, quote, being a vegetarian or a vegan is not an end in and of itself, but a means towards reducing both human and animal suffering and leaving a habitable planet to future generations. Um, if in vitro meat becomes commercially available, he went on, I would be glad to try it. Um, Singer's support of cultured meat is entirely in keeping with the argument of his 1975 book, Animal Liberation, um, which rejected a rights framework for animal protection and embraced instead Jeremy Bentham's view that animal suffering be considered within the same moral circle um, that encloses human suffering towards an accounting of the greatest good. There are animal activists for whom Singer doesn't go far enough, but by and large, Singer's views are in tune with the intellectual style of the cultured meat movement, which is often the instrumentalist intellectual style of engineering. In the utopia of cultured meat, morality is subject to capture, a set of outcomes that we can determine ahead of time. Perhaps a well-known play on words has been forgotten. Um, utopia, or the happy place, is also utopia, or no place, the unreachable island. Or perhaps the architects of cultured meat are simply more confident than I am about our ability to make what we can know and to know what we can make. Um, now, leaving my quibbles about the designability of the future aside, there are at present two major technical hurdles making a future of cultured meat impossible. Um, the first is growth medium. As of 2018, the best way to get muscle cells to proliferate in a bioreactor is to feed them a nutrient solution known as fetal bovine serum, or FBS, whose name gives away its non-vegetarian status. It is derived from the blood of an unborn fetus taken from a slaughtered cow. Scientists are searching for a vegan growth medium that works just as well. These exist for medical experimentation, but they cost far too much to be used at the scale of food production. Um, the other technical hurdle is um, thickness, or dimensionality. Um, muscle cells for hamburger or sausage can be grown two-dimensionally and then formed into a loose mass of muscle tissue, but steak and other more complex forms of meat rely on muscle and fat being layered together and probably grown together in three dimensions. And this then requires um, a vasculature system because of the nutrient diffusion limit for mammalian tissue, which is um, about 100 or 200 microns or about the width of a human hair. Um, cells can't live further than this from blood supply. The official future of cultured meat presumes that we will not only clear these hurdles, but also devise ways to grow meat uh, at vast, really vast scales. Of course, if we could achieve such a feat and grow that kind of thick tissue at that kind of scale, it's important to register that the implications for medicine would be as great as the implications for food production, and greater if you value human health over the reform of meat production. Let's assume that cultured meat arrives and fills its projected market niche, but with unexpected and negative consequences. Here we are in, in dystopia. This is the bad place. In Frederick Paul's 1952 science fiction novel, The Space Merchants, a Galton whistle beyond the range of human hearing is blown to manipulate the flesh of something called Chicken Little, which is, quote, a gray-brown, rubbery hemisphere some 15 yards in diameter. Um, she, she seems to have gender, responds to the whistle by moving and even producing apertures and doorways in her flesh. 
Chicken Little is alive, Paul's narrator observes, and this narrator, like the other factory workers in the future society Paul imagines, eats cutlets of Chicken Little every morning before he goes to work. Paul's not specific about how Chicken Little is grown, although she's fed through a sequence of nutrient pipes. She lives in a great concrete domed nest within the same factory complex where her consumers work and live. Chicken Little might be cloned from real chicken cells, but even this is never really clarified, and the story of the space merchants unfolds in a world substantially artificial. Everyone drinks a beverage called coffeeist, which has no relationship with real coffee. The real is gone, but disturbingly, everyone is aware of fakeness. The real exists out there, somewhere we can't touch, like an inaccessible existential itch. Much like the chicky knobs in Margaret Atwood's Oryx and Crake, Chicken Little is more of a symbol of something gone awry than a causal element of civilization's decline. Both are symbols of the ersatz, much like William Gibson's passing reference to vat-grown meat in his 1984 novel, Neuromancer, which made much of the distinction between meat space and cyberspace. In fact, casual references to ersatz food in science fiction novels are important because they are so casual. We're meant to think that fakeness is part of the furniture of the fictional world, requiring little elaboration. And descriptions of fake meat in dystopian fiction are not simply descriptions of a practical problem. They usually signify much more, in particular, life lived beyond the bounds of nature perhaps because our ecosystem has been damaged to the point where it no longer supports agriculture. One common device in utopian literature is natural food enjoyed without work, but cultured meat can easily become the negative mirror image of this. Instead of a new golden age, we get an age of dross. If cultured meat production merely enabled continued and unrestrained economic growth, it could easily be compatible with dystopian scenarios. At one point in his Arcades project, Walter Benjamin quotes a, a bit of verse by authors who waxed utopian in 1832, citing the doctrine of Saint-Simon and describing a golden age reborn. Quote, sheep roasted whole will frisk upon the plain and sauteed pike will swim in the Seine. And it'll snow wine, it'll rain chickens and ducks cooked with turnips will fall from the sky. So the impossible and disturbing image of a creature that frisks even after it's cooked and cooperates with its own destruction in the service of our appetites should stick with us. Dystopia sometimes unlocks the potentially disturbing aspects of utopia, including the idea that rational design could perfect our material estate upon this earth. Now, in food dystopias, the main cause of trouble is usually taken to be Malthusian. Populations have run beyond uh, national or global carrying capacities, and with our resources depleted, we have to find new subsistence strategies detached from our ecosystem. But the presence of ersatz food also suggests to me a problem of meaning. Hans Blumenberg described this problem in 1957 the same year that Sputnik orbited the globe, a tiny, beeping, artificial world with its promise and its threat of transcendence. In an essay entitled Imitation of Nature, Blumenberg argued that in modernity, our view of all of the, the tools and the technologies and the architectures that we have built changes dramatically. A new attitude towards invention pushes us out of a prior mindset about artificial things a mindset that is tantamount to a kind of Aristotelian garden in which all aspects of human making either imitate or extend natural processes. In that garden, technology um, was of the same order of being as nature, and it did not sever us from it. Technology might even be described as our means of connection with the natural world. Um, but we exit, we exit into a paved world 
and we're uneasy there, for we have made things that have nothing resembling a natural telos unless we've given them one. Blumenberg's argument applies to the case of cultured meat um, almost too easily. Cultured meat is the imitation of natural form uh, pursued by exploiting existing natural processes beyond their native context in the animal body. It appears, however, that in vitro extension troubles many people as much as a sheep roasted whole frisking upon the plain. Early surveys of potential consumers of cultured meat have produced mixed responses, including many expressions of disgust, as if cultured meat really were matter out of place. Um, Blumenberg went on to claim that the theme of modern intellectual history is actually the tension between the grown and the made, between the organic and the artifactual. Now, I want to ask whether or not cultured meat, which seems to eclipse that very distinction between the grown and the made, might in fact uh, represent its troubling afterlife and one that we haven't really learned how to think with. For Hannah Arendt, the distinction between the grown and the made, one version of the made at least, finds its salience in our political freedom. In the prologue to her 1958, The Human Condition, Arendt begins with Sputnik as a symbol of the desire to replace the world with an artificial and transcendent surrogate. She uses this and other science fictional fantasies to emphasize our status as children of nature, arguing that the existence of unmodified natural horizons has supplied the context for our experience of political freedom. She goes on to deride the expertise of scientists and engineers as speechless in the sense that they no longer participate in political life. They move in a world, she says, where speech has lost its power because speech is no longer truly necessary. Um, I really think that Arendt does scientists, I really think Arendt does scientists a disservice here. Um, but she seems to have anticipated certain aspects of our own age in which some still enthuse about technocratic solutions to social and environmental problems. It really is a remarkable thing that Arendt chose a science fictional starting point for her first mature th statement of her political theory. What's important about Arendt's discourse on science and engineering for my purposes today is not only its indictment of a culture of scientific expertise akin to the culture that produces the idea of growing meat in labs, but rather its convergence with a very different line of argumentation about biotechnology, which was once offered by the literary scholar Annelise Francois. Francois argues that genetically modified crops and food animals are, quote, continuous with a tradition, a philosophical tradition, of distinguishing humans from other animals on the basis of their relationship to possibility. I'm gonna say that again. Continuous with a philosophical tradition of distinguishing humans from other animals on the basis of their relation to possibility. Francois places great weight on Descartes' distinction between humans and animals uh, as the origin point of this tradition he understood animals to have machine-like bodies and humans to be distinguished from animals by the possession of a rational soul. I would suggest, in fact, that this philosophical tradition, though influential, is less directly salient than a more generalized and often non-conceptual tradition of raising animals as both companions and tools. Uh, but this is probably splitting hairs. What matters are the difficulties produced by believing that we can see and govern the full run of nature's possibilities. And here's how Arendt and Francois seem to converge. Arendt worries that an artificial world will wall us off from the conditions of life in which we encounter our freedom. For Francois, what's valuable about nature is not um, based in a fantasy of nature's purity but is located in the idea that nature contains possibilities that we have not given it. At stake for both thinkers is our capacity 
to imagine novelty and change or to be surprised by the liveliness of the world. And here I am concerned on the side that the idea of a hard juxtaposition between biotechnology and nature's capacity to surprise us seems a little cramped, too cramped to account for many forms of biotechnology for which fabrication is a pathway to knowledge and exploration rather than to control. But here we are in the weird. The official future of the cultured meat movement has done quite a bit to sideline the weirder versions of cultured meat. Um, it needs to. It really needs to because its goal is to convince potential consumers that cultured meat will seem as familiar and desirable as conventional meat. But somehow, weirdness survives. Um, the weird could be described as the potential of both nature and culture to surprise us, and perhaps to do so in concert. But surprise need not mean delight. It can mean illuminating options we had not recognized, or that we could not have anticipated or planned. In the decks used by professional futurists, the weird is the wild card. Like utopian or dystopian futures, a weird future can serve as a crucial mirror on the present, which has long been one of the primary critical functions of science fiction. We have one beautiful effort to document cultured meat's strange potential, which is a book uh, published in 2014 and called The In Vitro Meat Cookbook. It's really an art project more than it is a cookbook, um, produced by a Dutch design team called the Next Nature Network. Um, although the book contains all manner of forms of meat, um, many of them mimetic, many of them copies of familiar hamburgers or sausages or steaks, the book's creators also imagine meat that exploits the plasticity of lab-grown tissue. Here are a few examples. I hope they show up okay in the slides. Folded, carefully folded origami meat, translucent sashimi meat, a meat flower that expands in broth, and of course this uh, original image here is of something called the, the throat tickler. And the throat tickler is particularly upsetting because um, a pulse of electricity causes it to wriggle slightly as it passes down the, uh, the throat. Um, Oh, and there's, there's, of course, meat as, meat as wool for knitting. It's very important if you want to eat your sweater. Um, now, these are amusing, but they're also the potential results of leaving the animal body behind. If some of these creations, like the throat tickler, seem purposefully disgusting, they are obvious provocations ways of getting at the myriad issues and questions that attend the possibility of growing meat in the lab. Many of these questions, unsurprisingly, are psychological in nature, uh, as in the idea of consuming meat grown from human cells, yeah, or the idea of a beefsteak designed for bodybuilders which grows in tandem with the growth of their muscles. Um, if this genre of art seems overdetermined, um, it's worth saying that none of us were promised subtlety. Now, the 2014 cookbook was prescient with regards to laboratory research. While many of the cultured meat researchers I've interviewed are intent on copying familiar pieces of meat, others try to grow turkey cells on scaffolds made of jackfruit to create a kind of turkey nugget. And yet others speculate about using muscle cells from one animal and fat cells from another, which to my mind recalls Frederick Jameson's interpretation of Alexander Girard's essay on genius. Um, if even our wild imaginings are crafted out of uh, the parts of the here and now, this makes them either literal or figurative chimeras. Sometimes researchers are um, uh, comfortable with the idea of consumers understanding how alien lab-grown meat would really be. And sometimes they want this to be hidden within the product. And attitudes towards this issue seem to align more or less with loyalty to the official future of cultured meat. Much, much cultured meat research 
does seek to recreate something that has been in the process of falling away for a long time, um, namely the animal body itself. Such efforts at mimesis should prompt a question for us, I think. Um, why should the form of industrial animal products matter after the eclipse of the body? A wing or a drumstick from a battery-raised chicken is actually a strange thing. It's a kind of a memento of the unoptimized ancestral animal that we subjected to generations of domestication and breeding. The mimetic approach to cultured meat tells a story that might go something like this. Having moved away from one version of nature, we feel compelled to painstakingly recreate it and give it back to ourselves. We have completed the process of remaining carnivores while most of us live ever further from the natural resources that carnivory exploits. We have transformed our relationship with that resource and actually pushed exploitation and death out of view. And while that removal has a suggestive symbolism to it. It's not part of my brief today to explore it. And yet the very cellular processes that we try to exploit in this hypothetical new order have the capacity to surprise us. Cultured meat scientists may find that cells are less useful for making whole pieces of meat than say for making flavoring agents. Or they may find themselves producing edible chimeras of pig and cow and turkey cells. It's possible that no one will get the flavor of meat quite right and that this will lead to invention and novelty rather than to a sense of failure. Cultured meat might, in other words, um, become something more than the afterlife of animal agriculture. It might show us a new future for flesh. Um, the, the, Utopian future of cultured meat teaches us much, I think, about the limitations of control for futurist thought. And meanwhile, its dystopian counterpart helps us to diagnose a different modern problem, um, namely a double worry, which is simultaneously about human freedom and about the potential of the non-human natural world. Um, meanwhile, the weird has the capacity to subvert official futures and to remind us that living substance, even in vitro, retains the capacity to surprise us. Out of all of this, however, rises the troubling figure of the animal who wants to be eaten. On mange avec plaisir, sans fatigue. Um, this image illustrates in tragicomic fashion the incommensurability between the needs of modern humanity at scale and the needs of the non-human world. It reminds us that what seems like the reasonable pursuit of moral ends on the terms of philosophical utilitarianism might also stand in for our inability to resolve the tension between the needs of the human estate and the needs of the non-human. The only way to justify preferring the former to the latter is a statement of the moral priority of the former, the moral priority of the human. And if anthropocentrism is to be the general idea, it's always nice if somebody says so. Oh, moving on. In a wonderful essay on the concept of utopia, Ursula Krober Le Guin quotes Robert Elliot on the possible redemption of the word utopia. Quote, if the word is to be redeemed, El Elliot wrote, it will have to be by someone who has followed utopia into the abyss which yawns beyond the Grand Inquisitor's choice and who has clambered out on the other side. Both they and Utopia will have been changed in the process. Out of the hard-won understanding, there may come new faith in human possibility. Um, Le Guin's essay, which is remarkable, highly recommended, Le Guin's essay takes aim at the Grand Inquisitor's vision of producing a Utopia by what Dostoevsky called Euclidean methods, or in other words, using reason to regulate life at all levels. 
Le Guin's goal is to refuse the inquisitor's choice between happiness without freedom and freedom without happiness, between a future defined by control on the one hand and a future defined, you might say, by, by risk. Observing that the 20th century utopian imagination has become trapped, quote, in a one-way future consisting only of growth, Le Guin writes, quote, all I'm trying to do is figure out how to put a pig on the tracks. So here, to conclude my talk, is a pig. Um, my, my very favorite idea to come out of the world of cultured meat is called the, 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 the pig in a backyard. And I, I call it my favorite, not because it seems the most likely to materialize or because it seems like the most efficient way to resolve our practical difficulties with meat, which I think are very real, but because it speaks most directly to my own imagination. In a city, a neighborhood contains a yard. And in that yard, there is a pig, and the pig is relatively happy. It receives visitors every day, including local children, who bring it odds and ends to eat from their family kitchens. These children may have played with the pig when it and they were small. Each week, a harmless biopsy of cells is taken from the pig, and that biopsy becomes cultured pork, perhaps hundreds of pounds of it. This becomes the community's meat. The pig um, lives out a natural piggish span, and I assume it enjoys the company of other pigs from time to time. This fantasy comes to us from Dutch bioethicists, and it's based on a very real project in which Dutch neighborhoods raised pigs and then debated the question of whether or not to slaughter them. The fact that the pig lives in a city is important, for the city is the ancient topos of utopian thought. The pig in the backyard might also be described as the recurrence of an image from late medieval Europe that's been recorded in literature and art history. This is the pig in the land of cocaine. Cocaine, the big rock candy mountain of its time, was a fantasy for starving peasants across Europe. It was filled with foods of a magnificence that only the starving could imagine. By some accounts, you reach this land by eating your way through a wall of porridge. On the other side of the wall were all manner of things to eat and drink, coming up from the ground and flowing in streams. And pigs walked around with forks sticking up out of backs that were already roasted and sliced. Thus, the 19th century Saint-Simonian visions of roasted frolicking critters effectively recapitulated cocaine. In cocaine, birds would fly into our mouths already cooked, and we could understand cultured meat, I'm suggesting, as cocaine's cornucopian modern echo. The great difference is that cocaine was an inversion of the experience of the peasants who imagined it, a land where sloth had become a virtue rather than a vice, where food and sex were easily had, and no one ever had to work. In its gratification of our appetites, cocaine inverted heaven. By contrast, the, big, the pig in the backyard fulfills appetites without inverting virtues. The pig in the backyard seems to combine intimacy and community with an encounter between two different kinds of difference at once. There's the familiar but largely forgotten difference carried by the gaze between human and non-human animal. And then there's the weirder difference of an animal's body extended through tissue culture because that is literally what culturing animal cells does. It extends the body in both space and time creating a novel form of relation between an original, still living animal and its flesh, which becomes meat. The pig in a backyard obviously tries to please um, both hippies and techno-utopians at once, and I think this is part of its charm. Um, but what I really like about this doubled encounter with difference is the way that it promises, that, that word again, promises, to work on the ethical imagination. The materials for this work are on the one hand the intact living body of another being, which appears to have something like a telos of its own beyond providing for our sustenance, 
and a new set of possibilities for what meat can become in the 21st century. The pig in the backyard is only a scenario. Its outcomes are uncertain. It's not obvious that the neighborhood will want to eat the flesh and eat even the extended and harmless flesh of a being that they know well. But the practice of carnivory on farms suggests that they very well might. And it's not obvious that the people producing the cultured meat and profiting by it will have the same interests as the initial designers of the program. They may not be wild about the idea of ethical choice at all. The pig in the backyard is an experiment in ethical futures. It's full of risks. The pig points her snout at us and asks what kind of ethical persons we might become. Thank you so much. Uh, what a fun and enjoyable talk. I'm wondering if cultured meat has prompted religious organizations to rethink dietary law, whether for halal or kashrut, for example. Oh, okay. Um, thank you for that. Um, there has, in fact, been a bioreactor in the UK, not, not for cultured meat purposes, that has been blessed by an, an, an imam um, in order that its products be considered halal. So there is, in fact, a kind of precedent for bioreactors uh, for medical and non-medical applications needing to fall within the structures of various religious traditions. So, um, but as your question may anticipate, much as the world of art and design runs light years potentially beyond laboratory practice in the case of cultured meat, so does debate about how this fits into existing dietary categories within different religious traditions. And there has been a kind of precursor debate between different uh, rabbis about whether or not cultured meat would count as something that is kosher. Um, I had the opportunity to write a little bit about this. The whole chapter of the book from which this talk is drawn is about exactly the problem of cultured meat being kosher or not kosher. There are actually Talmudic tractates about artificial meat, usually created by miraculous forces. Um, so there is a kind of largely unknown and unremarked upon Jewish tradition of debating about the kosher status of artificial flesh, much as there is a kind of micro tradition of debate about uh, animals like the sturgeon being kosher or not kosher. Uh, as Jews have traveled around the world and over as food technology has changed, the laws of uh, kashras have had to shift accordingly. And um, there's a question about whether or not meat being produced by entirely new means might then have an, a kind of retrojecting effect upon kosher law for different Jewish denominations. And I can get more into the detail, but um, does, that, does that answer your question to some degree? You mentioned a Dutch experiment while, when they were raising pigs. Can you talk a little bit more about that and the outcome of that? Yeah, you'll have to forgive my pronunciation. I believe this is the Farkenhuis experiment, which I believe ran in 2011. And it was an experiment in which different neighborhoods in Dutch cities raised uh, pigs and then had a communal debate about whether or not to kill and eat them. Um, that's basically what happened. <laughs> um, largely, they did not vote to kill and eat the animals. But there are lots of questions we could ask about why that was. Um, I still think that the fact that people who live on farms routinely kill and eat animals they're very familiar with suggests that the pig in the backyard experiment wouldn't necessarily hit the roadblock of people not wanting to eat an animal whose name they know. Does, is, does that answer? Great. Great. Well, so anybody who's dealt a lot with a printer, say a departmental printer at a University understands that these are, of course, the most reliable technologies known to humanity. And the prospect of using uh, some kind of printer head with reservoir of stuff to produce, say, our food, of course, sounds equally reliable. Now, um, the company Modern Meadow, which is now a New Jersey-based biotech company that tries to create different kinds of artificial leather, back in 2011 was saying, we're gonna use 3D printing. 
we're totally going to use 3D printing to make all kinds of stuff. And that was because their parent company, forgive me, the, is called Organovo, had proposed to use 3D printing to create organs for human transplant. Now, the various failures and technical problems with 3D printing biomaterials led Organovo to backpedal on those initial ideas and instead create little samples of human tissue for drug testing. And those same ish hurdles involved in using 3D printing of biomaterials led the child company, Modern Meadow, to back off of early promises of creating both meat and leather and instead led them to produce leather-like biomaterials using uh, possibly at this point entirely non-cell culture based techniques. So, so, so 3D printing has been part of the sort of promissory culture of cultured meat for a few years now, but uh, we don't have any evidence that it is something that's going to work well. Now, everything I say is in the somewhat skeptical key of scholars who look at science and technology, right? And um, I leave the door wide open to be surprised myself. Uh, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Um, related to kind of thinking about technologies and um, culturing meat, I was thinking about Sophia Ruth's work and thinking about um, hackers and biological hacking and background. I, I guess my question is, is this culture meat limited to the university sphere or are there also people thinking about trying to do meat cultures outside this laboratory sphere, so in garages or elsewhere. I'm thinking about how centrally located these laboratories are and like, because people can learn how to farm and produce meat. Not many people could necessarily maybe um, also produce cultured meat. So there, there, thank you for this. There's a couple of very suggestive ways of responding to the question, in part because Sophia's work involves synthetic biology, which is ordinarily the construction of organisms for the pursuit of some form of scientific knowledge, as opposed to uh, necessarily, although at this point it's shifted, at this point it's often as, an, as not a product of some kind, as in companies like uh, Ginkgo Bioworks in Massachusetts. Um, the question of what it is to produce life, philosophically and ethically, runs through both synthetic biology and the very distinct practice of trying to use tissue culture techniques to produce meat. Um, what they have in common is that they can be pursued, as your question uh, uh, suggests, with all kinds of scales. Um, however, in the case of cultured meat, the big question about whether it should be produced in, uh, or pursued, I should say, in a university setting as opposed to in uh, industry, is not really a question about um, uh, scale alone, but a question about speed and a question about money. And in fact, and I didn't go into this in the talk, so I really appreciate the question, the chance to go into this in greater detail. Um, cultured meat is a technology that appears to be developing vastly more slowly than the venture capitalists who want to invest in it need it to. Now, um, if you have somebody who needs some version of return on investment every 18 months, and they're looking at a technology that may or may not mature for years or a decade, you have a very obvious kind of shortfall between one kind of expectation and another. One of the things that's happened in the world of cultured meat is that in recent years, promises on behalf of this technology sort of get closer and closer to the present. So um, a few years ago, it was 10 to 20 years. And now we have one company which um, was called Hampton Creek, and I think they're changing their name to something else, promising to release a cultured meat product of some kind within 2018. Right? So many people are promising that this is immediately at our door. Um, however, um, many of us who haven't seen the evidence for this yet remain skeptical. Um, so uh, I'm sort of answering your question and sort of not. The, the, the prejudicial answer in which I, I tell you my opinion um, is that I still believe that organizations like uh, a nonprofit called New Harvest, which supports 
um, research into cultured meat in academic laboratory contexts are doing something very important because the technology matures slowly enough that university labs might be the best place to do it. That runs into a problem though, not only because funding from NSF and NIH is hard to come by, but also because cultured meat doesn't fit easily into the funding categories of either of those organizations. Yeah, thank you. I'm interested in this um, relationship between the food and politics in terms of like uh, going forward with like cultured meat. Um, and then I wanna ask about the relationship between cultured meat and another kind of like future food innovation coming out of Silicon Valley, which is like the total food replacement sludge, like Soylent or Huel out of the UK. And as for me, it's, there's kind of like a liberal proliferation of options when it comes to cultured meat. And there's a bit more of a totalitarian closing down when it comes to Soylent and Huel. I was wondering if you had any more thoughts about that. Well, I just want to make sure that I've understood your question. Can, 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 can you, so, so what you're saying is, Okay, so let's, let's assume that these future food forms eat, have a kind of politics to them, right? That they're infused with a certain way of thinking about the world and thinking about our relationships with agricultural production, with our relationship with nature more broadly. Now, um, do I understand you? Yeah. Okay. Um, it is, it is it's, it's Purim, so we also have to acknowledge other important holidays like Heultide. Um, <laughs> but um, I think that um, I, I, I think this stuff gets a little easy. I, so I think that the claim that a, a technology, say a food technology, maps onto a particular view of the world is one that I, I always want to be cautious about because I think that it leads to a kind of plug and play interpretation that produces crap social science. Um, however, um, I do find Soylent to be gross for reasons of my own, and I'm tempted to say that on some level it's totalitarian, but I don't think it really is. I don't think it really is at all. I think it reflects a very particular minority fantasy about what our relationship with sustenance could be like and what our relationship with other people with whom we share foodways and an ecosystem might be like. Um, and one of the reasons to go read Warren Belasco's book, Meals to Come, is there's a chapter on the food pill. There's a chapter on the sort of Jetson's fantasy of getting our nutrition in little doses and on um, all of the ideas that fed into that, one of which at certain points for women utopian writers was actually women's liberation from, from cooking and from drudgery. So there are actually, there's sort of uh, politically progressive by some lights versions of the story of these foods of the future that by other lights might seem totalitarian to us. Is that, is that a useful answer? Um, so I'd be curious to know if you've seen any um, research or if there's any consideration for the health impacts of eating lab-grown meat as opposed to natural meat, and in particular how that compares to the health impacts of plant-based meat products. These studies do not exist. And they don't exist for good reason. So um, one of the very funny things about researching emerging technologies is that you, you really spend a lot of time looking at the intellectual tools people use to try to understand them before they're here. One of, to give you an example, there have been efforts to do sort of speculative life cycle assessments of the environmental impact of cultured meat without it existing. And that study, which was done, I think, in 2011 by Hannah Tuomisto, then an agricultural and resource economics grad student at Oxford, she's, Hannah's res, revised that research many times. And, um, uh, often under pressure from different interest groups. Um, so I, I tend to think that these kinds of speculative studies like hers do have some ver version of politics in their optics somewhere. Now, health effects. We have nothing. And I, I, I actually, this is one of, the, 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 one of my reservations about Pat Brown's Impossible Food, which as many of you in the audience may know is a plant-based burger company which um, I think its competitor is uh, Beyond Meat, which also makes uh, lab, uh, sort of um, uh, plant-based patties that are hamburger-like. Um, I've tasted them. They are the closest thing I've ever tasted to uh, an animal-derived hamburger. Um, 
the one thing we don't really know is what are the long-term health effects of eating a lot of extruded plant protein um, that's extruded at high pressure and temperature. I, I think of these things as sometime foods, not everyday foods for that reason. I'm sorry that I don't have a more satisfactory answer to the question. Two questions, two questions that maybe draw out something you've already raised. So one has to do with, I'm, I'm struck by the non-weirdness of the utopian vision and I, as the point that you're making about it. And it's the familiarity um, of this, this idea. So I'm wondering about the distinction between made and grown and the distinction between the lab and the field or the lab and the factory farm, which doesn't seem to sustain, right? These, this, the lab is very much where our current food is coming from. So I'm wondering who's attached to that distinction? Is that something that is, what, what, what place does that distinction have in the kind of promotion of this utopian thing? Is there a kind of current way, a way of describing the current food system that's kind of inaccurate? that comes from that. And then the other question I think goes back to the idea of like, is this a garageable technology or is this a kind of improvisational technology? And thinking about things like the green revolution and seeds and the way that property relations are built into the substance of things and what kinds of experiments are there in property to go along with this meat such that it could be um, backyard grown or not, not a kind of centralized corporate um, product. Yeah, totally. I, I wanna see if I understand these uh, two questions before answering. The first question um, was, if we have this distinction between the grown and the made, uh, and if cultured meat seems to run somewhere between those categories, who's mobilizing those categories and to what end? Is that, is that? It, uh, well, in some ways, yes. In some ways, no. I mean, this is really a, a sort of a, this leads us to a statement about what it is for animals to be in concentrated animal feeding operations and for chickens to be battery raised. I mean, the question is really, um, where are they between being animals and being, as Mark Post likes to describe them, bioreactors on legs? And I think that um, all of these characterizations of them do have a political position or a moral position on uh, animal agriculture running through them. And I don't think that it's very easy to just say what something is and what it, is, what it isn't. Um, the significance of the distinction in the book from which this is drawn is straight up Blumenberg. It has to do with trying to find a way to describe our unease with that very distinction. Uh, when it comes to um, how the social actors in the story are mobilizing these distinctions, I would say that the story, as much as you might expect, celebrants of um, conventional animal agriculture insist on the distinctiveness of animal tissue from in vivo sources uh, as opposed to in vitro ones. And they have a strong argument because frankly, um, one of the characteristics that meat taken from an animal has over meat that wasn't is that it reflects the life of that animal. And um, you may be familiar with the distinction that Harold McGee, the um, food writer, has drawn between um, what he thinks of as the rural style of creating meat and the urban style of creating meat, with the former involving eating animals that have done work on farms and have, are a little older um, and have a, a, a character to their meat that reflects what the high value word is terroir, the terroir of the land that they, they were working. Whereas the rural style of eating meat is to eat younger and fatter animals um, that really didn't live beyond uh, the point of, of easy and obvious slaughter. Um, so uh, for many people, natural is the defense of uh, what they think of as the rural, their version of the rural side of that story. Um, now, on this, the side of the cultured meat enthusiasts, the effort is to use various kinds of marketing terms to redefine in vivo meat as unclean, as, as, as I was, was implying. Um, is this a partial answer to your question? Um, I, I, I'm uncomfortable with it all, to be honest with you, and I think that it ends up being a kind of laboratory in which we can see the complicated and often intellectually inconsistent ways in which people describe their, their food practices. Can I ask a question? <laughs> um, 
I was I was just thinking about um, in, in thinking about the ethics around the production of cultured meat. Is, is the economic context, the socioeconomic context of the consumers of the meat also considered? So, what I what I mean by that is, you know, I, I'm thinking about how what, how expensive this meat might be, and who will then benefit from its production, and who might not have access to it. And so, you could have, you know, like um, poor communities are going to have, or you know, they they eat cheaper meat, let's say, at like uh, fast food um, restaurants, right? Um, so are, are these, is this cultured meat going to then go into those kinds of places? And so we have cleaner, healthier meat for, you know, uh, lower socioeconomic communities? Or I guess just my question is, how is economics, um, socioeconomics thought about in terms of the morality of this um, cultured meat production? I mean, um to try to answer that question, I, I think that the way pr potential producers of cultured meat think about potential consumers of cultured meat is in the same intellectually and cons consistent slapdash fashion that they think about many things. Uh, I, and I, I think that this is one way in which they should get a lot better. They should think a little bit more seriously about points of entry into market and then the sort of eventual shaping of a product that could reach or undercut the cost of a cheap meat, sort of hamburger, chicken sandwich, and so forth, then that's the dream. They, that, that is what they all say they want, and I, I believe them. Um, the other, th but this, this does bring up a question, which is how much we know about what they're doing. And uh, for those people in the cultured meat movement who are working in startups, by and large, they, have both incentives and rules keeping them from talking about a lot of their detail, the details of their strategies. So the need to defend, to defend intellectual property goes hand in glove with taking money from venture capitalists. Um, this means that uh, there probably is a concrete and far less skeptical answer to your question than the one I just gave you, but I can't as a field worker get it. Um, so so there, there's a cloud of unknowing, right? probably uh, indirectly mentioned it, uh, what type of a process would be required from a regulatory perspective for this to actually end up as a marketed product? Is there gonna be regulatory oversight by some kind of an agency, <coughs> drug administration or some involvement? Uh, I can't imagine the uh, USDA would be involved in this that would... Uh, well, why not, why not? Okay, so the question is, question is regulation. Who's going to regulate it? How are people thinking about this? The answer is um, that, in fact, helping me to supply you with an interesting answer, the, United, the U.S. Cattlemen's Association, which represents ranchers, recently uh, uh, had their lawyers write up a petition to the USDA uh, to give us, which we don't have apparently, a legal definition for the terms beef and meat there is no legal definition for the terms beef and meat. And they want one, and they want one that serves their interests. Um, and the fact that, that, that they, that, that an organization that understands their membership to be potentially threatened by cultured meat, want to invoke the power of the USDA to get a product that doesn't exist, right, to portray itself as something other than meat or beef is very suggestive. One of the things it means is that the USDA is an organization that they suspect will be uh, regulating cultured meat. Um, and another is that people believe that um, uh, you can do things with words, as it were, right? 